compare it to the, the in person, um, uh, I would say, um, talks uh, in this um, uh, quarter. And then, uh, so I was first say the, pos the possible, the possible is uh, scalable, scalable, all, all in lowercase, um, scalable. Uh, and then, yeah, so let me do introduction uh, of the speaker. So, um, so, and then, um, uh, I guess um, you guys probably you haven't seen her before, but then uh, I guess she's a new faculty uh, in the X department. Uh, so she, so her name is uh, Yanning uh, Shen. So uh, she uh, got her PhD from uh, University of Minnesota, uh, Twin Cities. Uh, but, so and then uh, she actually win lots of like awards uh, in, for example, uh, best student paper award finalist uh, of the uh, Asloma conference and also uh, many other ones. And then she was also selected as the rising uh, stars in X by Stanford uh, University. And then uh, her expertise is on um, machine learning, uh, data science, network sciences. I, I believe all those are kind of buzzwords um, today. So I guess she, she's also, so I believe she's also trying to boost up her group. So if you're interested, definitely contact her. And then another thing I want to definitely say is that she recently just won uh, the grant from Microsoft uh, for uh, AI on research. So uh, with um, uh, Professor Joe here, uh, uh, Professor uh, Lee here. So uh, it's actually, uh, it's a very, um, it, it's actually very rare because uh, there are only two uh, group of priorities like, like across the world. So they are well have the, the groups. So it's uh, very competitive and then uh, definitely they are the top expert you want to look for if you want to uh, also work on research in the, the AI and the machine learning and optimization. So anyway, I don't just take the, the, the time for the presentation more and then just turn the floor back to uh, Yenny. <laughs> for the introduction and uh, uh, thank you very much for having me here for in-person talk and thank you everyone for being here. This is actually one of the very first times that I back in first giving in-person talks after one and a half year. So uh, I'm glad I can see so many audience and uh, get back on stage. Okay, so today my talk is about uh, adaptive online function learning with graph feedback. So there are several keywords that I want to uh, bring your attention. One is adaptive, online, function learning, and graph feedback. Okay? So these are our keywords that we will, will be clear in the talk one by one. Okay? So first of all, uh, Let's talk about function learning. So what is function learning? Why are we interested in function learning? And especially nonlinear function learning, okay? That is because function learning is a general problem in many machine learning tasks, okay? Actually, uh, many uh, problems, many uh, applications can be viewed as a function learning. For, for example, disease diagnosis, face recognition, air pollution prediction, they can all be viewed as a nonlinear function learning problem. Why is it so? Because uh, basically you're trying to learn maps some input to output, right? So, and um, for example, in disease diagnosis, you're, the input is a image of the brain image and the output is a label, whether this uh, patient has certain disease or not, right? So the challenges of uh, function learning is, however, uh, that first of all, we all know that we are in an era of big data, that most of the real data sets are of massive size, uh, which course causes the problem for processing the data and learn the function uh, in an efficient manner. Secondly, the nonlinearity of the function that we are learning is generally unknown. So we usually don't know what kind of function we are learning. Last but not least, in many of the real world applications, we are faced with dynamics. So the environment is changing. And the dynamics, how the environment is changing is generally unknown. Okay? So given these uh, 
specific challenges in this work, we are interested in scalable and adaptive online function learning that can learn the nonlinearity from the data and can adapt to unknown dynamics. Of course, specific challenges of, uh, of scalability will be considered as well. And uh, we will also provide uh, theoretical analysis in terms of the performance of the parameter. So let me first give you the background. What is function? Let me formally define what is learning a nonlinear function from data. So basically, here, let's if you look at the supervised learning, I suppose most of you are familiar with that. We are given data xt and yt. And then we find, try to find the function that maps xt to yt, where d is a noise that is not modeled. Some uh, examples are, for example, the regression problem. The easiest uh, task is the linear regression, right? Where it is usually, uh, it's a usual problem in, in tasks such as curve picking, for example, for temperature for testing, okay? Where basically the XT, what we are trying to do is we are trying to fit a line that goes through all these points which may arise in temperature prediction tasks. Another example is the classification that we already mentioned, that where the XT are the images, for example, brain images of certain subjects, and the YT is uh, the label whether this subject has a, a certain disease or not. Okay, so we can see that these both regression and classification tasks can be viewed as a function learning problem. Uh, and in addition, even unsupervised learning, such as dimensionality reduction, clustering, anomaly detection can all be modeled as a function learning task. In this talk, I will focus on regression problems. Uh, oh, sorry, I will focus on uh, supervised learning problems. Okay. So now I want to discuss, uh, I want to uh, present a general framework a popular framework that is used for function learning problems. Okay, so suppose we are given a set of data, xt and yt, with, with a finite number of data points, capital T number of data points. Let's think, if we want to find a function that maps xt to yt, how many choices there are? So think about the curve fitting problem. Well, we had a bunch of points and then we find a line that goes through all these points. The answer is we will have infinite number of choices of this function if we don't have any constraints. Okay? So we need to put the function that we want to learn in a certain function space so that we have finite choices. Okay? So kernel-based learning basically tries to learn the nonlinear function from uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is defined as this. Okay? So the function form is a superposition of kernels, which is a kernel function of x, which is input, and xt, which are the data samples that we collected. Okay, so this is called reproducing kernel Hilbert space. I will show it as RKHS from now. On. So the function learning problem now can be written as find the, the function in this RKHS with certain type of calls and the regularizer. So the cost is used to characterize the discrepancy between the y, between f xt and the yt. Okay. And the omega is a regularizer to avoid overfitting. One example of the cost function is, for example, in regression problem, it can be used to squirt. In classification, it can be a logistic uh, loss. And here, a key, a key uh, element of this problem is a kernel function, okay? So let's have a closer look. Let me give you an example about what is a kernel function. How can this kernel function influence the, the uh, nonlinear function that we learn? So uh, 
a very popular uh, kernel is the Gaussian kernel, which is uh, written as this is the exponential of the difference between x and xp with certain boundaries. Okay. Now let's see what is the uh, there's let's see that what is the effect if we choose different kind of a kernel function. Okay, so suppose we are in a curve cur fitting problem, we have these number different red dots are the sample points. If we want to fit a line, um, fit a nonlinear function to all these data samples, then if we use, let's see what is the effect of different sigma, different choices of sigma, we think it's a bandwidth of function. Yes. Can you see uh, in, the, in the kernel filters the trace definition coming from uh, the sample data that we have? Data that we have? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is not yet. So uh, the the RKH is, is defined as a general sample point. See, there's an infinite number of yeah, sample yeah. points, right? I guess that's your question. Yeah. And how we will cope with infinite number of sample points at a later point? This will be clear in the next slide. Good question. Thank you. Okay. So. We can see that if we use different Gaussian kernels with different bandwidth, what is the difference of the resulting curve? Is the smoothness of the function, right? So we have we will obtain different nonlinear functions if we use different kernels. Okay. So now the question is: since you are learning the function in certain RKHS, which is defined by a kernel, how can we choose appropriate kernel? Okay, so this will be clear later. And just to answer your question, uh, as we see that in the definition of RKHS there, it's defined of infinite number of data samples, right? So, but in reality, we only have a finite number of data samples, which is capital T data samples, you already said, right? So thanks to the representative theorem, it actually can be proved that the optimal solution in the case when we have only have a capital T number of data samples, the optimal solution of this function learning problem uh, we have here can be written the, in terms of the finite number of data samples. Okay, so the optimal function is a superposition of kernels lies at my sample points. So, however, here we, we can see that in this case, we can at least solve this problem, right? It's in, instead of an infinite number of parameters, we have capital T number of parameters. But here we can see that the alpha, which is the coefficient of the kernel function is of the size capital T, which means that the complexity grows with capital T, which means the number of parameters grows with the number of data samples, okay? And uh, let's think of uh, the simplest case where we have our L2 norm cost and L2 norm regularizer, which gives us a rate regression, which is of solve this is of complexity T cube, okay? So uh, that means, uh, that means if we keep all the data samples in the memory, then uh, we, will we will have a problem that in order to solve it, it grows of the number of data samples we have, okay? And then this batch form also requires you to have increasing memory to save all the data uh, in, at the batch because this problem needs to be solved in the batch and all the function estimates is related to the previous data samples that we already collected. Okay, so it's not scalable and not suitable for streaming data. This is also known as the curse of dimensionality. So now uh, there are several ways to solve this, right? So one thing is uh, one simple uh, scheme is saying that instead of saving all the data in the memory, how about we set a bias? Whatever you can afford to compute or whatever you can afford to store, you store it and then you discard the rest. 
there has been arguments coping with this. Basically, said a uh, budget B, and when a new data comes in, either you try to prune it for certain criteria, either discard or replace replace the original data sample that we can manage. Okay, but the challenge here is uh, what is the choice of B, and it is usually not adaptive to unknown dynamics. Uh, the problem is when we have more data, what we want to do in function learning is actually we needed to solve the original problem again, right? So it's a batch optimization problem. Whenever you have a new data comes in, you need to solve for this problem again. Mm -hmm. And this is not amenable for online implementation, also because the parameter size also increases. So it is even not amenable for stochastic uh, upgrades. Does that make sense? Thank you. Okay, so now, uh, in order to solve for this, uh, we want to uh, we want to solve for the problem of cursor function, right? So we said that budget based uh, method is not necessarily a good one. So we will resort to the random feature based uh, learning. So if we look at if we look at a normalized shift invariant kernel function, which basically says that the kernel function is only dependent on the difference of the two data samples, okay? And it can actually be written if as the Fourier transform of this pi kappa, okay? So this slide is going to be a little bit mathematically heavy. So stay with me and we will recap to see whether it makes sense, okay? So it can be written as a Fourier transform of pi kappa. So if we say that we are looking at a normalized shift invariant kernel, which means if kappa zero normalized means kappa zero equal to one. Okay. So if the two xt and xt prime are the, are the same, then the kappa will output as a one. So this is the normalization. Okay. So if we are not look at a normalized shift invariant kernel, then let's see what it says which may basically says if xt is equal to xt prime, this term will be zero, right? And we look at it here, this exponential will give us a one, right? Because xt minus xt prime is, uh, is equal to zero, so exponential will be one, okay? And if we say kappa zero equal to one, which basically says that this integral of pi kappa multiplied by one is equal to one. Okay, so that, and also we know that the kappa kernel functions are positive definite. So we can see that the pi kappa is positive, def, uh, sorry, is non negative, and its integral equal to one, which gives it its a valid PDF, right? So pi kappa is a valid PDF. Henceforth, we can see that the kappa now can be written as the expectation of this exponential with respect to a PDF that is pi kappa. Okay. All right. So for those of you who did not follow the maths, just believe me that kappa through certain transform we can be written as the expectation of exponential. Following pi kappa, where pi kappa is a, a Fourier transform of the kappa function. Okay. So now it means that we can draw capital D random vectors from the PDF pi kappa to find the kernel of this. Because now we can draw capital D data samples to replace the expectation using the sample. Okay. And in addition, we know that the exponential can be written as a cosine and sine. So after certain mathematical derivation, we can show that unbiased is uh, the uh, unbiased estimator of the kappa can be written as the inner product of these uh, random feature vectors consists 
of uh, sine and the cosine of the original data okay. and the random vector VI. Okay. So let's recap. Okay. So then what, what we can see that is uh, in, originally we say that the F function is a superposition of the different kernel functions. Now it can be replaced by the estimates and it can be written as a theta transpose multiplied by the VB. Where this theta is now of size 2D and it does not grow with the time anymore. Remember, the previously we say that the original problem is difficult to solve because there's alpha, which grows with the number of data samples we have. Now, after this random feature approximation, we transfer the original problem into a parameter estimation problem of theta, where theta is 2D, which is the number of the number of random features that we choose to draw. Okay. So it does not grow, does not grow with the number of data samples we have. And the parameter size is fixed. Okay. So let's see what we talked about. Given a kernel function, we can through Fourier transform, we, we can get the pi kappa, which is a valid PDF. And then we can draw random samples from this PDF. And then we can take the average and then we can get the kernel estimate haste test for the function estimate. Okay. In this way, we, we transfer a non-parametric problem to a parametric problem. The number of the, uh, the size of the parameters does not grow with the number of data samples. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, um, put what, but let me just put our work in context. So this you learning function using kernels have been started in literature using single kernel learning, multi-kernel learning, and online function learning using kernels have already been studied before. So in this talk, our contribution is we will develop online scalable learning adapted to unknown dynamics, and we will use data-driven multi-kernel selection in order to solve for which kernel function we want to solve, find. And we will also introduce a feedback graph-based kernel selection to characterize the interdependencies among kernel functions. And we will provide a theoretical analysis in terms of static and dynamic reverse maps. Okay. So let's see what is most kernel work. So, so, so far we have solved for the problem of a personal dimensionality. Okay. But we still there's still another question that at the beginning of the talk we said how can we select the kernel? Right? So when think of this when we don't have enough information in or in terms of which kernel of function suits our data best, what we can do is use a dictionary of kernels. So in this way, the function can be written as a complex combination of different nonlinear functions that are lying in different kernel fields of space that are defined by different kernel functions. Okay. So, and this omega uh, is the weights of the different nonlinearity and it can be learned. So we can see that. Uh, and multi-kernel learning provides a richer space of function, but it is also challenged by personal dimensionality. What we can do is using the random feature based approach for each kernel function. Basically, we draw different uh, random feature vectors or brought into different uh, PDFs. And we can now solve for the W, which are the kernel weights, and the theta p's, which are the function uh, parameters. Okay. So uh, this problem now does not have a personal dimensionality, but it is still a batch solver, batch problem, which means that whenever you get new data samples, you will need to solve for this problem. Okay? But instead, we want to do it in an online fashion, like incremental updates. And 
In order to do that, let's first write online loss per kernel per learner and this. So we basically split our original cost function into per terms of per task. Okay. Then based on this, when we ever we have access to a new data sample for each time slot, we can run stochastic gradient descent to update the theta p, which are the function uh, function uh, parameter, right? Well, for the weight update, so for the for the uh, combination weights update, uh, we can use the mirror descent using KO divergence regularizer, which can be viewed as this. Okay, so for those of uh, so so for those of you who are familiar, here we use the uh, KO divergence because Ws are PDFs. Uh, sorry, are uh, Ws are sum up to one, so they, they can be viewed as certain type of TMX. So we use KL divergence and mirror descent so that we get closed form update. But for those of you who are not familiar with it, this, uh, this update results in very simple updates, which is closed form, which is uh, exponential uh, updates. Okay. And uh, this update, why this update makes sense? Because here we can see that the WPT plus one is equal to WPT multiplied by certain exponential. Okay, let's see why this update makes sense. It's because if we look at this blue box, this has a loss function, right? Which is the, the loss incurred by the fun function estimate of P at the previous time slot. Okay. So this update basically intuitively says if a certain function estimate provide a function learner provides a larger loss in the previous time slot, this exponential is increasing function, but the minus is decreasing function, then its corresponding weight will be decreased in the next iterate. Okay, so I hope that intuitively makes sense. All right, so then. With this function uh, parameter update and the weight updates, we can get the function update by combining all different kernel-based learner together using the new updates. So let me provide some uh, intuition behind this. Okay. So basically, the the multiple online multi-kernel learner that we propose, we call it as Rika. It can be viewed as a combination of different kernel based learner here, yeah, which is minions. Each minion corresponds to a kernel. Okay. So at each time, uh, the, the breaker tries to combine the feedback, the output of different kernel based learner together using certain weights. Okay. So this algorithm actually is very similar to the structure of online ensemble learning is expert advice. Okay. Uh, but the difference is that each minion in this case is not that stupid. You know, they, they, they kind of can, they, they still know something, they get feedback from the, from the environment and they try to improve, do some self-improvement of each, each expert by updating of the data. Okay, and for iteration complexity with the existing method, we can see that most of the existing methods that they uh, their complexity increase with t, and our proposed methods because of the capital D random feature are fixed over time, so it doesn't per iteration complexity does not grow with time. Okay, so the next question is. What if the function changes over time? So you may say that uh, you, you develop an online algorithm where each, whenever you observe one data sample, you update the function, right? So you kind of have a function that function learner that can adapt to dynamics, right? That is true. That uh, Online algorithm actually have certain ability to adapt to new data samples and to adapt the the learner the model to new new data samples as time goes by. However, there's a critical challenge.
challenge is what is the optimal step size, right? So the optimal step size depends on the dynamics. So remember, whenever each uh, data sample comes in, we do a stochastic gradient descent, but we do it with certain step size. Okay. So this, how large or how small this step size we should use really depends on how fast the, the, the environment is changing. Okay, but usually this dynamics is unknown. So what we can do is we can combine weighted rate learners as we previously seen with different step sizes. Okay, so here we developed an adaptive version of the origin of the first version of the algorithm uh, with a multi-resolution design, where we add a rate learner at the beginning of the interval of a progressively larger lens. And then each rate learner will we use a different step size. Okay, so let to to be easier to understand, let's use this figure. So we can see that the x-axis is a time, y is an interval length, okay? So what it means is that as time goes by, remember this is a rate learner, right? And then we can see that as time goes by, different rate learners will be active, okay? And then they are operating at a different step size. And this, the size of the this figure denotes the step size, which is corresponds to different level of adaptivity. So at a certain time slot, for example, here yeah, there will be different number of uh, raker learners that are operating at a different level of adaptivity, and then we can combine them together by certain ways. Okay, here I just illustrated a case with uh, I is uh, the orders of two, but you can design these based on your specific application. Okay, so how this A director works is uh, at each time we obtain all these uh, active rate learners with different step sizes. Okay, so here are the multi kernel and here are the adaptivity part of the rate learner, right? And uh, use we can use the weights of the rate coroner can be also updated use exponential update okay so then the output of the adaptive rate learner is just the output of the weighted combination of these different rates okay. so the idea and the updates are very similar they are all using exponential update basically they are all results from a uh, Mirror descent, online mirror descent with the scale divergence regularizer. But the underlying idea is very similar. Basically, it's a result in closed form updates using the previous, the loss of the previous time slot. And then we can see that this design basically says that there are, it's a, it's a two layer kind of design. The first layer is trying to learn the non linearity. Okay. And here, the second layer is trying to learn the adaptivity, okay, to, to learn the dynamics. Okay. So, and in terms of uh, uh, performance, so we, in terms of performance, we, we needed to characterize how well this online learner is operating compared with the batch learning, right? So, in, uh, Despite the fact that we say that this uh, this algorithm has uh, adaptivity and can work, but how well it works? Okay, so let's see how well it works. We, in order to characterize the performance, we use the regret analysis. So here we first define what is the regret. Okay, so the regret is uh, defined as the loss incurred by the online learner. You can see that f hat t is the the, the, the output of the online learner and the LT is the, the loss of the uh, online learner compared with the best fixed strategy in hindsight. Okay, so we can see what is the, this term that we are compared with is suppose we have all capital T number of data samples already at hand. Okay, then we solve the original problem at the batch. 
Suppose we wait till the end and we solve for the problem or together. Okay, so we compare the loss. And then we can see that a sublinear sublinear regret implies that the algorithm incurs no regret on average. Why is it so? Because if we take an average one over t, then if the regret is sublinear, then as time uh, uh, goes on, the average will approach there, right? Will converge to there. So that's why a sublinear regret in implies no regret on average, and we ideally we would only say, okay? And in fact, we can prove that under certain uh, assumption, the rate color, the non-adaptive version can achieve a sublinear regret, okay? Which means no regret on average. On the other hand side, uh, we also want to characterize the uh, performance of the adaptive version of our algorithm. Okay? And in this case, we want to use a different uh, criteria because we claim that, that it can adapt to unknown dynamics, right? But we, in this case, we don't want to use the benchmark as the best fixed strategy at high five because the optimal function may change over time. Right. So in order to characterize this performance, we define a different kind of regret, which is defined as this. So now it is if check t star is defined as this. So it's the best switching solution. Here it is defined as the, the function, the, the set of function, uh, fun set of functions that it does not change uh, more than m time. So now this benchmark is a time varying function instead of a time invariant function. So we still suppose we have all the data samples at time size, and we find the best set of function that fits the data, but does not change more than n times. So we can prove that eta rate achieves a regret of this order, which means that if m is sublinear, so if suppose the function does not change that each and every time slot, the, the number of switches is sublinear, then the regret of the argument is also sublinear. Okay, so in this way, we prove that, that the argument is also adaptive to unknown dynamics, because here we don't need to know where the changes are happening. We just find the best set of functions that does not switch that many times. Okay. So, Eda Ricker incurs no, uh, on average, no regret relative to the optimal switching solution in normal dynamics. All right. So here uh, I presented some uh, performance, uh, some uh, numerical tests. Um, here is a synthetic data test so that we know where the switches come from. We compare it with the multiple different algorithms, and then we can see that. Uh, the non-adaptive version works the fastest, and the adaptive version, uh, and the adaptive version uh, achieves the best performance. It adapts the fastest in the switching point. You see the red curve here. Okay. So we also tested on other data sets, uh, on real data sets about activity monitoring, uh, and here the red bar on Ada Rica. We can see that it achieves the best performance for air pollution prediction. Also, the, the red bar corresponds to the ADA rate curve. Okay. And here's the for energy consumption uh, prediction as well. Okay. So, so far we have talked about uh, uh, how to learn the unknown nonlinearity how to learn the unknown dynamics. And uh, uh, we said that they use a multi-kernel learning approach will help us to figure out the uh, non-linearity, right? But here, but again, you may, for, for those who likes to play the devil's advocate, like myself, we say that, okay, you don't know how to choose a kernel, you choose a, you select, you select a, dictionary of kernels, but 
how do you choose a dictionary kernel, right? So now the challenge is if you employ a very large dictionary of kernels, right? In this case, you will have the rigid, the, uh, the richer function space, okay? But it may increase the computational complexity and even may deteriorate the accuracy of function recognition if we include too many uh, kernels that are irrelevant. Okay. But so now, the, so this motivates us to think one step further, say that if, you know, ideally we want to start from a large set of uh, kernel dictionary, and then we create, right? We, we select a smaller subset of it, but we still want to have the ability to see the result of a large set, but eventually we pick a small subset instead of combining all, all the kernels in the dictionary altogether, right? So the idea is now we want to choose a subset of kernels. So instead of, a, remember previously we, we said that the function estimate is a linear combination, uh, sorry, complex combination of all kernels in the dictionary. But now we say that we are faced with a huge number of kernels and we want to select a subset, okay? So uh, at each time, the task is performed using only a subset of the kernels in ST and this subset can change over time, okay? So previously, the, once you select a dictionary, we use it for each learning round. But now we do a subset selection. But now the question is how to do the ST. So in this work, we go one step further and study the subset selection problem. Okay. So here we resort to the uh, modeling of using graph based model. Okay. So suppose uh, we have a bipartite graph, which is basically a graph of two sets of nodes, P kernel nodes that we previously said, each node corresponds to one kernel and J selects the nodes, okay? And then uh, we have weight associated with each kernel nodes and the weight associated with each selecting node, the updates of which will be clear as we describe the R results, okay? And then, okay, so here, just to make a connection that previously all these uh, capital uh, P kernel nodes are being used in each learning round, right? Which corresponds to one union here. Okay, so this now we have a bipartite graph basically, which says that the selecting nodes are collected, connected with the kernel nodes. Kernel nodes are connected with selecting nodes. Okay, so the idea is that each time we will in each learning round, we will select one select three nodes and use the kernel nodes that are connect, connected with these selective nodes to do function approximation. Okay. So at each time slot, we will choose one of the selective nodes with certain probability. So I will not go into super details. Basically, here, if you remember that UJT is uh, associated with each selective node, which characterize how reliable this selective node is, okay? So this basically is its uh, exploitation part. It's, this is exploration part, right? So basically it says you have certain probability to still see the nodes that you haven't selected. Okay? So at each time slot, uh, we will choose one selective node with based on this uh, this uh, probability, and uh, we will use the, the set of kernel nodes connected to the chosen selecting nodes to do the function prediction. All right. But here, one element is still missing, right? One key element is uh, how do you construct it, the, this graph? Right? So this, uh, this uh, bipartite graph, uh, so, here are the uh, fun the parameter updates and the weight updates as similar as the, before the previous argument. Okay, but the key point is, as I said, the what is the bipartite graph? How can you update this bipartite graph? Okay, so uh, each selective node draws uh, kernels with respect uh, replacement. 
based on the weight of these kernel nodes. Where basically what this this what this says is that each selected node has a certain kind of budget, but how it picks which kernel nodes to be connected is based on this WP, if you remember, is how reliable certain kernel nodes is. Okay. So this is this we will construct the bipartite graph using this the PD, uh, PMF. And then this so if each each selective node to pick a subset of uh, nodes to be connected. And then it goes on until all the chain selector nodes have their neighbors. Okay, so this is how the bipartite graph is being constructed. And as you can see, that this is dependent on this WPT, which is updated in each iteration of the R. Okay, so this bipartite graph is refined online and it will be uh, used again for later for the uh, kernel selection and for the function estimation. And again, it iterates. So it iterates between, between parameter updates and uh, uh, bipartite refinement. Okay, so, so this is, uh, so till this end, we solve the problem that there are only a subset, a huge number of kernel nodes, and then we select a subset, right? But here we can see that we are using bipartite graph, right? Which says that the kernel nodes are not connected with each other at all. We are just selecting them independently based on their previous uh, the, the performance in the previous data sample. And this graph refinements need to be done in every iteration. Okay, so this motivates us to think one step further because we, as we see in the very first slide, that the kernels are certain kind of nonlinear functions, which is defined by certain parameters, right? So in, instead of saying, okay, uh, we select them independently, we actually have some prior information about how these different nonlinear functions are correlated or how these learners are correlated. So we say that. Online refinement of the bipartite graph structure requires computation and refinement at each time uh, instant, so might be time consuming. So we, next, we propose a feedback graph construction based on the similarity around among kernels. Okay, so which does not which can be constructed offline, and then no refinement is needed, which reduces the complexity. So how can we characterize? the the difference between the kernels okay? so we can actually we use certain kind of distance measure between two kernel functions and it is a data independent notion of similarity okay so based on this we can use the similarity for offline back feedback graph construction so now instead of uh, saying that each uh, kernel nodes are not connected with each other. Now we connect to them using these kind of dissimilarity or similarity uh, measures. Okay. So ideally, what we want to use is we don't want the kernel that we pick are have too much redundancy. So we want to connect to them using dissimilarity. So once I use this kernel, I want to use something that is not that similar to what I already chosen. Right. So that motivates us to uh, to Let's just look at how the feedback graph is constructed. So for each node P, remember P corresponds to your kernel, you, we, each node P will have a self loop and all self loops. And then we will add a node that is the, achieves the maximum average distance of all the current out neighbors of this node P. So at each time, uh, uh, I will add one node one by one as the, the neighbors of a certain node. I pick the one that is most dissimilar compared with all the out neighbors of my 
current argument. Okay. And we set a certain value. Okay? So what it says is now the blue nodes are kind of connected with each other. And each time I pick one and I use all its out neighbors as uh, as my function as my uh, kernel candidate. Okay. And this graph is uh, constructed based on the dissimilarity of the origin curve. So instead of saying that I completely rely on the data and uh, on the performance, I say that I want to further reduce the redundancy of my model because our uh, similar model may achieve similar kind of accuracy, but may not be the best. Okay. So, uh, so this is a feedback graph construction. The algorithm is built upon this, feed, this feedback graph and has a lot of math in it. For those of you who are interested, I encourage you to check the write-up, which is uh, available on RCAM. And I will just skip the algorithm part and show you the regress analysis and both the GF which is the bipartite base and the similarity bipart uh, similarity graph based uh, algorithm achieves uh, sublinear regress. Okay. And we did some experiments and we showed that uh, the, the bipartite based outperforms of all baseline, but the similarity based uh, runs the fastest. Okay. And actually, it runs considerably fast faster than many of the best baselines. Okay, so uh, here I focused on mostly kernel learning, right? But we can see that uh, all these arguments that I have already described using all these minions as a kernel can be replaced by neural network, right? So the only different part is uh, the, for the neural network, the parameter update part will not give you a uh, theoretical analysis, but the kernel combination, the learner combination, part, median combination part will still operate the same. Okay, so we ex further extended to use neural networks as the minions, and we tested the performance using our uh, graph feedback based methods. And then we can see that feedback graph design works for general learners other than kernel. Okay, so that's all I introduced the. Uh, uh, Raker and Ada Raker and the feedback based arguments and show that you experiments on different applications. And uh, yeah, thank you for your attention. Any questions? So, yeah, thanks, uh, this speaker. And uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, Great talk. Uh, maybe I can ask one question. Uh, I mean, further extend your slides about the, the uh, neural networks and uh, the uh, kernel methods. I think that question is always be in my mind. Uh, so regarding the trends of the kernel methods and neural networks, how do you see they, they go, especially the kernel method? Uh, because I think the dominance is still the neural network. Uh, the market. Uh, do you see any further development or synergy between those two things? That's a great question. I think many of the uh, researchers in the area ask a similar question. That's why there are uh, actually recent links. Uh, there are very one very hot topic is the neural net tangent kernel, which kind of connects the neural networks with kernel methods and say that. In order to understand the neural network as a, 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 very, a kind of shallow but very wide neural network can be viewed as a certain kind of kernel learner, right? So I think that, of course, in terms of uh, how well it works, neural network has its potential and it provides very good performance. But on the other hand side, the explainability and the reliability of neural networks is always a uh, question. And I think kernel methods, if we can connect there, it will give, uh, will make a huge impact in order to be able to analyze and understand how the data looks like. And as you can see that you think actually here is a very interesting connection that you mentioned. You can see that the random feature based methods can be viewed as a 
one layer neural network with a specific activation function because it is using the input multiplied by a random feature vector and then use a sine and a cosine function. Okay? So it, then in this way, I think that maybe let's say if we can, and you can see that our work promotes a high, uh, present a hierarchical design. So if we can kind of connect it there to try to provide insights from the kernel learning to the neural network, that would be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I saw another. Yeah, if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we do selective, uh, when we select a kernel subset, uh, if, uh, our future data stream does not in our future data stream is invariant to the selection we made the previous time. Do you mean the what what is invariant? Can you repeat that part again? You mean the data stream or the data. kernel? Yeah, the data stream is independent of the selection we made from our earlier time. That is true because we assume that we observe data in an online fashion, but we our decision making does not influence the future data. But we do have worked on a more active learning based method. Basically, says that also we pick whether we reveal the label of the next next data sample or not, like because the labeling may have a cost. So. Based on the previous, uh, we, we also have a work that is uh, uh, called a more active learning approach, but we don't, we don't control which data appears next. But what we can decide is whether we will label the next data, whether we will inquiry the label of the next data. But currently, yes, you're right, that it, it is independent about the, the decision making and the data Streaming are independent. Uh, another question. <laughs> okay. Oh. Uh, yes. Hi. Uh, hi. Uh, so, for the smart cities, are you actually implementing the same model? Uh, been actually, is there any work that is being done, or this is like just a suggestion here? You mean the, the smart cities, right? Smart yeah. cities, basically what I mean here is the uh, application of air pollution prediction, energy consumption, and the temperature prediction that I presented in the experiments. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, so all these are, you know, but no, we, we just downloaded uh, real data sets to, for the experiments. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, I guess our time is up. So I just saw many other the questions there. So feel free to talk to uh, Yenny directly. So uh, I guess that was a great talk. And then let's just give another round of uh, uh, applause to Yenny.